Before we begin, we would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land in which we are based, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, and extend that respect to the elders past and present. Hello and welcome to Inspire, our fortnightly series where we talk to interesting people and share their learning. Today we're joined by Peter McArdle, Board Director of Engineers Without Borders and Researcher at the University of Sydney. During his career, he's worked with Red Cross and multiple other NGOs with WASH. Could you please tell us a bit about that? Yeah, sure. So um, I've, uh, after studying uh, Civil Eng at Newcastle, I, I worked for Hunter Water for a few years. Um, but then, yeah, as you say, moved to the Red Cross, which was about 10 years ago now. And over the last decade, I've uh, taken about nine different assignments with them uh, in various places from the Pacific um, to, to the Middle East. So very, very different contexts um, and a few others in between. Uh, and also in different types of um, crisis situations. So some are uh, natural disaster type emergencies, some are public health crises, uh, others are uh, uh, violent conflict. Uh, so it can look like very different things within that space. That certainly sounds like you've had a lot of experiences and made it quite an impact. What motivated you in the beginning to actually become and focus on humanitarian engineering? So I'd love to say that it was a grand plan and I had big ideas, but I, to be honest, it was probably a bit of naivety at the start and, um, but also curiosity. So I'd been, um, you know, over the course of my, my studies, um, I, I started engineering just, you know, like many people do because I like to build stuff. Um, but then you start to get a wider understanding of the world and, and some of the issues that are out there. And so little by little, I, I'd learn a little bit more. And then it got to a point where I was like, okay, well, there's, there's clearly a need for some, um, for, for water out there. There's, there's a lot of people who don't have access to clean water and sanitation and so forth. So I, I joined the Red Cross uh, with an advertised job um, that they, they still run. They still run these intakes. Uh, and my work started in a very small scale community based, I suppose you would call it development type type role. So this was in Vanuatu in the Pacific. I was there for a couple of years. Uh, and that was very relatively small scale. So um, household level latrines and some rainwater harvesting work um, out on one of the fairly remote islands there. So that was, um, where it started. But then once I was involved with the Red Cross, you, you know, you learn more about the organization. And of course, one of their key roles worldwide is to, um, to they're the, they're the, uh, the, they uphold the Geneva Conventions, which is the rules of war. That's one of their big roles. And so once I was involved with them, I understood a little bit more or learned a little bit more about the work they do in armed conflict and got interested in that and, and uh, decided that I'd, I'd want to take a, take a role in that field and so for, I went from Vanuatu to Yemen which is about as poles apart um, geographically culturally as you can possibly get so that was quite a stark contrast but then over the years also did a bit more of um, disaster work and so forth. so it was all it was a very much a learning uh, process as I went along I didn't when I started I didn't even know about the conflict work or that kind of thing so um, I think just having a bit of a curiosity about that workspace and, and wanting to try and direct my vocation in a, in a, for a positive cause, hopefully. Um, it, it took me to different places as I, as I went and learnt. That's a great explanation and following your like inspiration and just helping others is a great way to follow in your career. Um, with your actual time you spent as part of the board members for Engineers Without Borders, what actually have you done? Mm. So, well, just to, just to go back a sec. So I, um, I, I've been involved with Entities at Borders for a long time. So I think I started in the Newcastle chapter back when there was a Newcastle chapter in 2006 um, and stuck around with that for you. So I'd been on the, I'd been involved with the organization for a long time. And then I, when I started traveling, I, 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 um, I was always a member, but I wasn't heavily engaged. And then I decided that I'd have a go at joining the board um, about two years ago. And so uh, coming, coming back after, well, coming back into a closer proximity to EWB after those years apart, I saw it was quite a stark difference. Um, the sort of the growth of the organization, it started, uh, you know, as a, 
as a outpouring of enthusiasm um and it still is very much so in the chapters but then over the years we've sort of professionalized and and become uh increasingly organized i suppose and so when i came into the board i i was hoping that you know after a decade or so in the humanitarian space um that i'd be able to bring some of that experience back in but i didn't entirely know what that would look like and so the board is much less about operations like uh, actually running programs and it's much more about governance which is sort of about um compliance and, and the legalities and the financial side of things of the organization so what i've actually been involved with um over the couple of years that i've been on the board um i mean there's, there's a lot we meet every two months but um some of the key activities uh were we when we were revamping the uh, ethical partnerships framework so this is a policy that guides how we interact with with um partnership partner organizations um, and we did a a lot of work on that last year and it's it's quite a thorough and complex task um but that was that was really exciting and, and we came up with some some good stuff um i've um we have to uh, have, a, have a fair involvement in the financial side of things. So over the, over the difficult period that, that the world has seen with COVID, we have to sort of steer the ship a little bit in that, in that regard. Um, and that's been a tricky, but, but really uh, interesting and, and, and um, valuable experience. Um, some of the things that I, that I am trying to bring from my, my experience abroad and, and in the wider humanitarian space is, is to diversify our, our um, donor income as an organization. So most of EWB's finances at present come from domestic sources. So from the Department of Foreign Affairs Trade and from some of the money that we generate ourselves and, and from um, and from from the public, of course, and, and, and members. So um, and, and, and donor organizations. So it, most of it's come from Australia, but there are a lot of funding mechanisms um, out there in the world that we might be able to tap into as well, just to sort of diversify a little bit and, and see some income coming from somewhere else. So that's something I'm trying to bring in as well. That sounds like a great initiative. And it's really interesting to hear what's happening up at the board level from in comparison to the chapter levels where we work at. In your time traveling with the world you cross, you went to lots of different places and worked in lots of different situations. Where do you feel that you made the most impact? It's a, it's a really interesting question because the impact can look like different things depending on what's going on. So, um, so I might answer that question in two ways. So one of the, I guess, nicer bits about working in WASH, water and sanitation is that, or as an engineer is that you get to see very tangible results for your work. So we, we often usually work in, in, you know, pumps and pipes and whatnot. And, and, um, it's stuff you can touch, you know, uh, there are people who work much harder than I, uh, but don't necessarily get to, you know, feel the results, I guess. Um, so in that sense, probably one of the most obviously high impact um, assignments that I was involved in was the, uh, the Ebola response in 2015. So this is in West Africa in Sierra Leone. And uh, it's, it's strange because it wasn't, a, it wasn't a highly technical job but it was you know it was a very medical sort of uh, scene but then they had a few technical uh, non-medical staff there as well to sort of keep the the treatment center running and the chlorine going and the power on and so forth and so one of i mean one of my jobs there was to to head up the the grave digging team which sounds very morbid but it's a really important task and there's just no way when i was sitting in my geotech class back in the day that i would have thought <laughs> that it would go in that direction towards uh, towards digging graves, but it was uh, very useful and and uh, very tangible. Um, so that's and uh, you know it's a it's a it's an interesting thing because it's not yeah as I'm saying it's not super technical engineering, but it's also very uh, high impact engineering. So that's interesting. But then um, actually, my last assignment in Iraq was probably one of the most typical engineering like assignments that are done and, and in that context I was working on um, the water network in the city of Mosul in North Iraq. Um, this is a city that was very heavily damaged over the years um, between, it was the, this is the, one of the key sites of the battle between um, the Iraqi armed forces and uh, Islamic State group 
and left the city in, a, in an awful mess. Um, and it was a really, really interesting project engineering wise because you have this city of 2 million odd people uh, where at least half of it is just almost flattened, like just this very sustained, very heavy damage. Um, but it's not just the, the, the infrastructure that, that you lose, but in a, in a context like that, you, you also lose data and records and maps and this sort of thing. So we had to, we really had to start from scratch. It was, um, it was a very technically challenging project. And so I think you, you asked about impact and that's not necessarily impact, but I suppose if you relate impact to the challenges that you have to overcome um, to, to have a positive impact, that was definitely one of the more technically challenging projects that I've been involved with. Yeah, they sound like some, well, actually they are some truly cas catastrophic situations and yeah. you can definitely see how good hygiene would definitely improve the situations and help those in the area. Yeah, absolutely. And, and in a context like that one in, in Mosul, so, uh, you know, in order for people to be able to return to their city, you have to have some sort of, um, some sort of services. You need, you need, as you say, um, water for, for both drinking, but also for hygiene purposes. And, and you can't just come back uh, and reestablish your, your, your family and your household without some basic services. So, it, um, and, and we're talking about a million people. So it's, yeah, it's quite, quite a, uh, important role, I, I suppose. Yeah. If there was one thing that you could go back and tell yourself before you went traveling with the Red Cross as a WASH engineer, what would it be? And yeah, what advice would you give yourself? Hmm. Um, I would say it might be a little bit um, counterintuitive perhaps or something, but I would say stay connected. Um, and I mean, personally and professionally. So I think one of the biggest challenges actually with doing this kind of work is that it can be a bit transient and um, that can be really challenging. So it's, it's less about the, the work itself and more about you as a person in that situation. And so I would say it was, it was really obvious, for example, EWB, like coming back into a closer relationship with EWB a couple of years ago, um, how much I'd, I'd missed that kind of space. And um, I think, it doesn't have to be as much of a trade-off, you know, being away and being overseas and so forth um, versus staying connected. You can have a bit of both. And I think um, I was, you know, a little bit, I said I was a bit naive, you know, young and idealistic, and that's a good thing. It's a, it's a good energy to harness, but also uh, to realize that um, there's plenty of time and you'll do a better job if you look after yourself as well. That definitely sounds like a great bit of advice and it would apply for those at the moment who are in lockdown as well. Yeah, very much. I think as much as hugely challenging as the situation is, um, and it is for many people, um, yeah, it's also an opportunity to, to um, you know, have a bit of a reset and a break. And, and um, if you have that opportunity, I mean, I, I know exams still go on <laughs> regardless, but, but where you can to, to, yeah, look after yourself a little bit. As students, we always focus on the challenges of we're facing currently with universities being online. But as an act academic, what are the challenges you're facing with the current situation? Yeah, so uh, the, for, for me, it's been, I've had to readjust um, my, my program a little bit. So I'm in the, I'm just finished in the very final stages of my PhD, so finishing off. And uh, a lot of my work was fairly travel-based, even even my, my, my research. So, um, Luckily, I'd, I'd completed all my field work, which was partly in partly in Australia, in, in the Murray Darling, but also partly uh, in Yemen, um, and that was all done. But you know, to present the results of your research, I'd planned some, I planned a visiting scholarship program in in the UK for a little bit, and and normally when you complete a big piece of research, you present it at conferences and you you get the work out there. And I haven't been able to do that to the same extent that I was supposed to present. Uh, my research in, in Stockholm at World Water Week uh, in August, actually about, about now, uh, but obviously that's postponed and that's okay. It's, it, you know, it'll, it'll still happen uh, in due course, but yeah, you do have to, you definitely have to readjust um, your expectations around those things as well. So it's not, uh, it's not, hasn't been terrible for me, but it's uh, definitely, definitely not 
what I thought it would be either. So. It's definitely interesting to see how the current situation affects all industries. As part of your career has involved a lot of traveling, what is the your favorite place that you've actually visited so far? It's a very tough question. It's a very tough question. Um, and similarly, I suppose uh, it, depend, it depends on your criteria, but I think if I was to give a simple answer, it would probably actually be Iraq. I really enjoyed Iraq. It's a fascinating place. Um, it has a lot of struggles, obviously. Uh, a lot of the sort of thing that you see on the news is true uh, and is there. Um, it, can be, it can be some challenging security situations at times, but it's also, it's also not all like that. Um, the city I was living in is much, much calmer um, and, 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 and functional. And um, I mean, the, the, the people are just lovely and, 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 and um, it's just a really interesting, fascinating, ancient, uh, engaging place to be. I really, really enjoyed Iraq. I haven't been there yet, so I'll have to check it out sometime after Corona. Yeah, for sure. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. It's been a pleasure to talk and learn from you. You're so welcome. Thanks for having me. Now we've got our next reoccurring segment, Craft Corner. So everyone enjoy. Enjoy.